as I got ready uh, for, uh, to prepare for the mod lecture series, I was talking to my wife, and she asked me, she said, what are you going to talk about? I said, about an hour. That was a joke. <laughs> oh, just make sure you're still with me. I asked her for some advice and uh, asked her what, what I, how I should craft my remarks. She offered uh, that I should start on a light note. I should end with a moving story and not to put too much in between. I asked her, how will I know if I'm talking too long? She said, if they start to clap, you've gone too long. So with an eye on your hands and an ear for your clapping, I'll start my remarks. Today I want to share some thoughts about being an HR professional and then take some questions. I'm always interested in what's on your mind. There are many aspects of being an HR professional, but I'd like to focus on a few. Precision, character, mentorship, leadership, and the personal touch. I'll provide some examples and share the impacts and one example of when we didn't get it right. Precision matters. Precision. When you hear the word, what do you think about? Perhaps you think about the precision displayed by the guards at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Arlington National Cemetery. Everybody knows who they are, everybody knows what they do, and everybody knows how they do it. Their physical appearance, their uniform, their demeanor is flawless. Their movements are like the Swiss timepieces, exact and accurate. Their solemn duty, done 24-7, under all circumstances and all conditions, is high performance. They, they are the epitome of perfect precision. We have to be precise, too. I can remember the first time I, I learned the importance of precision. I was a uh, young second lieutenant in Germany. I was the S-1 for an engineer battalion, 800 strong. Now, the Army of the early 80s that I described early that I came into was much different than the Army that you have today. The soldiers weren't the same caliber, and uh, the, the Army was kind of at a tipping point, if you will, for which way it was going to go. Brand new, I'd been on the job for about a week. The battalion commander called me in, and he said, I'd like a legal update. So I uh, went to my legal clerk, my first mistake, not going to my NCO. I went to the legal clerk, PFC Ray, and uh, to date the story, we didn't have computers back in those days. We had typewriters, but PFC Ray was not a real good typist. So when I went to him and asked him for a legal update, he uh, said, sir, it'd probably be quicker if I just wrote it down. So he wrote down uh, the, all the actions that were pending. There were about 20 court martials and about 20 chapter actions that were ongoing in this battalion of 800. Probably more than I've seen in my entire career since then. But the, like I said, the Army was at an inflection point. Do we go down the path we're on or do we get better? So being a uh, young second lieutenant, eager to answer the battalion commander's question, I reported to the battalion commander's office. I saluted and said, Lieutenant Siemens reporting, sir. I've got the legal update. He said, Provide, proceed. So I went down the legal update, this court martial, that court martial, this chapter, that, that chapter. And at the end of my update, I paused and I looked at him feeling pretty good that I checked the block, I'd answered his question. He'd be very impressed with this new second lieutenant, S1. And he asked me, he said, do you have any questions? I thought that was kind of a funny thing to say. I said, no, I, I don't. He said, well, I have some for you. He said, what's a chapter nine? I said, sir, the best I'm going to do is it's after 8 and before 10. Um, <laughs> I laughed as well. He didn't. And uh, I, I was taught humility at a very early age. Not my best day in the Army, but certainly an opportunity to learn the importance of precision. When we're manning the force, conducting promotion selection boards, processing evaluations, slating battalion and brigade command teams, we strive for precision. We consider and select in place the right people in the right positions at the right time over time, both for them and for the Army. If we do it right, we build readiness in our units. If we miss, we put our Army, our soldiers, and our nation at risk. Ma'am, I hope you don't mind if I share a story about General Maude and the nickname he had, you may not even know this, when he was at EPMD. Uh, Brigadier General Maude came into the Enlisted Personnel Management uh, Directorate when I was a uh, captain, uh, and he, the nickname he earned was General Y, as in W-H-Y. Uh, and if I'm going to be honest with you, the director had gotten a little lazy. We didn't have much rigor in our staff actions. We often took the path of least resistance. We rationalized. We were busy. We had a lot of things going on. And hopefully good enough was good enough. And along comes General Maude. General Maude uh, would listen to a brief, and he'd ask the question, why? He would push back and not accept a short answer, yes or no, or because. He would push back again and say, why? Show me. Teach me. Answer the question. What's your analysis? Show me the research. Without directing or telling us, he was challenging us to up our game. The message was subtle. The message was clear. Behind every action is a soldier. 
and we owe it to them to be able to explain what we're doing and why we're doing it. Precision leads to readiness, which is our number one priority, and precision matters. Character is essential. Character is essential to all we do in uniform. It means doing the right thing even when no one's looking, and it means standing strong under great pressure. I'd like to share a story about a lieutenant in the 82nd Airborne Division. The lieutenant was in charge of preparing the multinational force observer rotation for their up upcoming deployment to the Sinai. The MFO mission was there to help bring peace to the Middle East, a very important mission. And the AG lieutenant had the mission primarily of getting the passports for 600 paratroopers, which meant getting birth certificates, ID, filling out the paperwork, and coordinate, coordinating with the State Department. No passport meant no deployment. At the update in front of the commanding general, the lieutenant was briefing, and he shared with some pride that the, uh, we, they were about 10% uh, complete. Now in the audience was the division command sergeant major, the chief of staff, the G1, the G3, and the G4. And the CG said, what did you say? He said, sir, we're 10% complete, and that's pretty good. CG stopped him again and said, are you sure you're happy with 10%? The lieutenant said, yes. The CG said, before I get, ask again, I want to get a sense for where your, your standards are, where your values are. The CG asked the command sergeant major, if 10% of the soldiers in the division passed the PT test, would you think that's a good, good answer? Command sergeant major said no. He asked the chief of staff, if we were only funded to 10% of our budget, would you be happy with that? The chief of staff said, of course not. The CG asked the G1, if 10% of the units were filled with proper manning, would you be happy? The G1 said, of course not. He asked the G4, if 10% of our vehicles could roll out the motor pool, would that be a good thing? Would that mark success? The G1 echoed everybody else's comments and said no. The CG then looked at the lieutenant again. He said, let me ask again, are you still happy with 10%? The lieutenant stuck to his guns and said yes. There was a pause, and I suspect that maybe a uh, bead or two of sweat dripping down the lieutenant's face. And the CG looked at him and said, I think you're right, 10% is about right. The CG was testing that young AG lieutenant to see what he was made of, and he passed with flying colors. The lieutenant's name is Rob Manning, a former commandant of the AG schoolhouse, who stood up to incredible pressure. Character is indeed essential. Leadership is what our soldiers deserve. We all want leaders who care for our soldiers and families. And what I found over the years is most of what you need to know as a leader, you learn as your first couple years in the Army, and sometimes we need to be creative. When I was in the 25th Infantry Division in the 556 Personnel Service Battalion, we used to take our detachments and rotate them to the training centers with brigade combat teams. This one detachment was aligned with the 3rd Brigade of the 25th Infantry Division, and they were slated to deploy to the Joint Readiness Training Center at uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. They trained hard. The detachment trained with the, with the BCT and on their own. They took a certain sense of pride in making sure they'd get it right. The team arrived in JRTC, Fort Polk, and they went to enter the box after a few days of in processing. And one of the observer controllers, whose job it was to limit who came in, you had to be on a certain list, a tip fit to make it inside the box, searched the tip fit for the detachment. Not being able to find it, he told the captain that he and the team wouldn't be able to enter the box after traveling all the way from Hawaii to Fort Polk. After arguing with no success, the captain walked away. As he walked away, he heard the one observer controller say to another one, it's too bad they're not a postal unit. We have a postal unit on the manifest, and they didn't show up. The captain went back to the installation AG, spent the afternoon getting the uh, soldiers certified with, to be mail handlers. A couple hours later, went back to the server controller, the same one with the same vehicles and same equipment. And the server controller said, uh, I saw you before. I didn't let you in then. I'm not letting you in now. And the captain said, well, you said there was no room on the, on, on the manifest for a personnel detachment, but what about a postal detachment? And the server controller said, but the funny thing is you're not a uh, postal detachment. And the captain said, gentlemen, show them your cards. And so recognizing the adaptive and creative leadership of Captain Al Kellogg, who's now the first Corps G1, they went inside the box and their rotation was so successful that the brigade commander publicly stated of the top two or three things that made the rotation successful, it was Captain Al Kellogg and his team. Leadership is what our soldiers deserve. Mentorship is our obligation. Growing the next generation of leaders is a critical task for all of us. Sometimes you're mentored even when you don't realize it. When I was a major at PERSCOM, what we now call HRC, I was flying to Forces Command with General Maud for the monthly unit status report brief. After we re reviewed all the notes and slides, which, oh, by the way, were TBT, 
typed by Tom because we didn't have many computers back in those days. The mentorship began. General Maud asked me what I wanted to do the following year after I graduated from Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. I responded I wanted to go back to Fort Bragg and jump out of planes with other paratroopers. He said, hold that thought. He said, given your personality and your background, I think you'd be a good small group instructor at the schoolhouse. He went on about how important the small group instructors are, the opportunity to grow and mentor and develop the next generation. He spoke at length and was quite compelling. He then asked, now, what do you want to do after you hear Leavenworth? So a little bit of pressure. I paused and I said I still wanted to jump out of planes with my fellow paratroopers. What I didn't realize at the time is he was trying to mentor me. He was trying to broaden me and make me a better officer. In hindsight, had I followed his wise counsel, Melissa wouldn't have asked me years ago, why, didn't we, why weren't we ever assigned to Fort Jackson? Because I would have listened to him. It was a missed opportunity on my part not to listen to him, and I've thought about that over the years. Mentorship is our obligation. Personal touch is what we do. Personal touch turns a math problem into a positive outcome. We are HR professionals, and we do personnel. Personnel as in N-N-E-L. But if we do it right, we do personal, N-A-L. The Army's downsizing, it, yet we're still hiring. We, we are involved from the start of somebody's career to the end. I think it's really cool that the first person a citizen meets when they join the Army is an AG soldier, their recruiter. The entire time they're in uniform, we take care of their promotions, their assignments, their awards. And on, on the uh, tough days, we take care of the casualties. Everything that touches the soldiers, we take care of. When they leave the Army, the last person to touch them is an AG soldier or civilian at the transition point. From start to finish, we're there for the soldiers. As we get smaller, we have to tell soldiers to go home earlier than they wanted. Many had dreams of a career in uniform. The way we get, get it right in these tough times is a human touch. In the Pentagon, it's often seen as a number. In the field, it's not a number. It's a living, breathing soldier, many with families, with hopes and aspirations, and we play a big role in helping the commanders get it right. You can tell a lot about a leader, you can tell a lot about an organization by how they treat those who are leaving the organization. If we, you, ensure our transitioning soldiers are treated with dignity and respect, they will be the soldiers for life that we need. Personal touch is what you do. To the students in the room, once, once your time here is complete, those of you headed to operational assignments will be relied upon to serve the command and commanders, and more importantly, the soldiers. Whether you're an AG soldier, Finance Corps soldier, soldiers deserve uh, and that you serve, expect to, that you to know and perform your duties with precision and character. Every personnel action, every finance transaction, every time you engage one-on-one -on -one with a soldier, leading them, mentoring them, counseling them, encouraging them, they have an expectation that you care enough that you want to be the best that you can be. Commanders have the same expectations. As I watch your hands and listen for your clapping, I'll share a few remarks about the man whose life we gather here today to celebrate, Lieutenant General Timothy J. Maud. If there were an entry in encyclopedia for older guys like me, or a Google search that talked to precision, character, mentorship, leadership, and the personal touch, it could simply show General Maud's picture, as he was the epitome of all we need and demand in our leaders. His technical expertise was second to none, he possessed a thirst for knowledge and an insatiable appetite to both learn and teach. General Maud approached each day of his career as a training opportunity. He was the very essence of a leader, a mentor, a coach, and a trainer. He often said the best and brightest ideas came from the user level, the soldier, the admin NCO, not the colonel or the general. I think he earned this insight because he started his career as a soldier himself. Lieutenant General Maud's enduring legacy of identifying himself as a soldier of caring for soldiers, of treating this business like the profession that it is, will forever shine brightly. The 3,700 strong soldiers, civilians, and contractors who work at HRC in the sprawling Lieutenant General Timothy J. Mott complex at Fort Knox are greeted every morning by a bronze plaque commemorating the building's namesake. It's not easy to miss, and often you'll find somebody reading the narrative that describes the events of 9-11 at the Pentagon. There are two things on the, the plaque that I think bear repeating, and I think they both speak directly to General Maud and his passion for soldiers. The first are his words, quote, true heroism is unremarkably sober, very undramatic. It is not the urge to surpass all others at whatever cost, but the urge to serve all others at whatever cost. 
The second was Lieutenant General Maud's signature line, I am Tim Maud and an American soldier. Let me finish with a story when we didn't quite get it right, where we lost our precision and lost our personal touch. It's a story about Sam. When I was the uh, MNC uh, CJ-1 in Iraq, uh, we had the full gamut of responsibilities, uh, and many of them I was able to mission command and, and power down to my team. The one area I wouldn't power down was casualty operations. I insisted on signing every award for a soldier who had fallen because I felt at some point that award might be on display and I didn't want somebody signing for Tom Siemens and sending a message I didn't care. The other thing I wouldn't release or let anybody else release were the casualty reports. One day we lost a soldier named Sam. Excuse me. We went through the normal rigors. We reviewed the report, we reviewed the award. Uh, we have about 10 people that looked over to make sure there wasn't a typo, the social security numbers and everything were right. We did the condolence letters for the uh, four star for General Casey and for the three star General Vines. We sent, uh, sent them off, we sent the casual report and then we went on to the next objective. About a week later, the, uh, the condolence letters were returned with a handwritten note on the back by, by Sam's dad. The, the note began, Sam was a beautiful daughter. Daughter. We pulled out all the reports. Sam's name wasn't Samantha, it was Sam. There was no place in the casual report for gender, male or female, and we just made an assumption. We took a shortcut. First thing I did was call Colonel Torgensen, who, who ran the Army's uh, Cash and Memorial Affairs, and she said, you're calling about Sam. I said, how'd you know? She said, because we screwed up the presidents, the SEC defs, the SEC Army's chief staff, the Army's letter too. So as we paused that moment, thought about what the damage we'd done to the family and the damage we could never undo, we thought about their loss and, and, and the message we were sending. The message should have been, Sam was a member of the team and we cared about her. The message we sent was, we didn't care enough to get it right. Um, and he, the father had also sent the letters back to the president and, and the chief and the secretary. So sometimes at the end of the day, when I, after a long day and uh, uh, things have gone, uh, gone wrong, and I wonder, hey, does it make a difference to stay another five or 10 minutes? Uh, does it make a sen sense to make another check of what we're doing? I remember Sam, and I get motivated to do what I need to do. Uh, I, I would also ask if you've not been to Arlington, uh, please, please remember Sam as you go about your duties as well. If you've not been to Arlington Cemetery, I hope you take time to visit the heroes who went before us who are, and those who are protecting us today so we can have a great event like today in a celebration of General Maud. When you go to Arlington, I'd ask you to stop by and introduce yourself to General Maud. He rests on a hill between President Kennedy's eternal flame and the grave of President Taft. On the Maud gravestone, as our great commandant said earlier, under the three stars reflecting his grade of Lieutenant General and, and underneath the AG shield, it reads, he took care of soldiers. He expects nothing less of you. Thanks for your attention today. I truly appreciate the opportunity to share a few thoughts and words with you. I am Tom Siemens, and I am an American soldier. Thank you.